Hey everyone, Social Solipsist here on a Friday night, uh, responding to a call out from my friend, Spencer Andrews. Now, Spencer uh, called me out a bit under two weeks ago, I think like 11 days, and told me that I needed to watch The Lost Boys and to make a review of it. So this is my haphazard review, seeing as I just finished the movie 10 minutes ago. I took notes, though. Um, Side note, uh, movie reviews is a thing. Movie reviews and other similar stuff is a thing that I've wanted to put on my channel for a long time, but uh, I have no idea what the appeal is, and I don't want literally no one to watch it, Um, especially if I do it with my one constant viewer, and (laughs) then there are literally no views. Um, Because then what's the point? Anyway, moving right along. The Lost Boys. Um, I'm going to start out with a no-spoiler area. Uh, Not that anyone gives a shit, but here it is. Um, The Lost Boys is a movie from 1987. um, And it is kind of all over the place. Uh, In general, I would say I had a pretty good time with it. Um, But it's got a lot of problems... And it has not aged well. Uh, It is very much part and parcel an 80s movie. All of the classic tropes are there. But it also does some clever things. Um, It's very... It was done on a very small budget. uh, Like under $9 million. Um, And yet, uh, probably because of the era it was done in, it has some pretty significant names attached to it. Um, Regardless of how you feel about Joel Schumacher as a director, uh, he certainly um, probably put a a decent chunk of stars on the map, uh, not the least of which a number of them are in this film, including, uh, who do we have? Corey Feldman. Well, that's not a good one to start with. Corey Feldman's gone off the rails. But uh, Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland is in it. Diane West is in it. Uh, there's like, you know, there's a handful of well-known Hollywood names in here. Um, most of them fairly early on in their, in their careers. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get into the spoilery territory coming up. So if you want to skip out... Um, now would be the time, even only, though we're only three minutes in. There's just no way I can really talk about this without getting into spoiler territory. So, here we go. So, this is ostensibly a movie about vampires. Um, but it's, it's, really, it's a really odd film. Um, it does not at any point seem to be able to decide what it is or wants to be. Uh, it is completely atonal see to see like scene to scene cut to cut characters have no depth and no growth um there is no sense of time scale it is a fucking mess and it has some pretty atrocious uh acting work in it as well um mostly from the main character who is just like classic 80s movie pretty boy main character who has no characterization at all and could not act his way out of a paper bag. I, I don't even know. I don't know his name. I don't think he did anything after. If he did, I, I definitely don't recognize him. Um, he looks, he's, uh, he, it would seem by the movie's vague portrayal that he is in high school. Um, but he's at least 30, like the actor is. So it's all over the place. So I don't want to get into a plot summary too much, but essentially uh, two kids and their mom, their divorced mother moved to Fe- or moved from Phoenix, why they want to go back to Phoenix, I don't know, to uh, San- uh, what was it? What was the name of the place? Is it n- not Santa Clara, it's uh, Santa Carla. California, which I promise you is just Santa Cruz because I recognize some of the of the uh, places there, particularly the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. 
um, which plays a major role as a set piece in the film. Um, and for some reason, Kiefer, Th- Kiefer Sutherland, the head of this gang of vampires in the hellscape that is Southern California in the late 80s, uh, decides to entice this newcomer to town who was hitting on his girlfriend to come join their vampire club. This is my biggest problem with the film. I cannot figure out for the life of me what the motivation of the antagonist and his crew are. Um, We're going to ignore the twist at the end, which I'll just say now is just that Kiefer Sutherland is not the head vampire. It's this other, you know, other character who's basically in it for five to ten minutes as mostly comic relief, even after the twist. Um, For some reason, Kiefer Sutherland and his crew, whose names I don't remember, that's why I'm calling their actors' names, um, are getting this guy to join them. And they never explain anything, and because he's a pretty boy box box of rocks, he... Drinks David, that was his name. Kiefer Sutherland's uh, character's name is David. They drink David, he drinks David's blood, for some reason doesn't figure out what's going on, just makes wrong turns the entire time, and then the rest of the movie is the conflict between the two of them because Michael has some weird attachment to this pretty-ish girl that he just met, even though he knows all of the reasons why she was there. She's basically there as bait the whole time. It's a whole thing. I cannot figure out for the life of me what Keith, what David is expecting. He doesn't seem to actually want him on the crew, but that's what he states his purpose is the entire time. By the way, I, if I hadn't said it already, I'm here with my co-host, Stockyard Oatmeal Stout. third one of the night. Um, so they, they go through the film with this conflict where Kiefer Sutherland seemingly both wants him to join, wants Michael to join as a vampire, but also seems to want to kill him. Go figure. I don't know. That's about the amount. That's about the entire plot. That's really it. It's a very 80s movie, like, thin on the ground kind of plot. I will say, um, well, let me not get into the good things yet. Let me keep, keep harping on it. A lot of this film is shot like shit. And it's not in the, like, hey, it was low budget and the director didn't know what he was doing. Because the director, I mean, at the time, even at the time, Joel Schumacher was a fairly well-known director, even if he wasn't super mainstream. Um, It has a very, I mean, it has the Joel Schumacher directorial aesthetic to it, uh, but it's still shot like crap. I'm sorry. Like, there's no two ways about it. Uh... And it's it's not it's not that he didn't have the cameras or didn't have the ga- the like the gaffing team to do what needed to be done. It's just weird. It's weird framing and shots that are on on uh, that are handheld for reasons that I can't fathom. Are shaky cam the whole time? I mean, there there there's there's handheld and there's shaky cam, and and this like this goes like well beyond you know, Sam Raimi follow cam type of like, it's hard to watch. It genuinely is. Um, and most of the effects as well are fucking terrible. Um, the wire work especially is just awful. Why they thought they could put wire work in a, in a movie with this many, this many, uh, sets, this many characters, this many actors and, and like, 
I don't know. They, the, I have no idea how they made this movie on eight and a half million dollars. Granted, it was the '80s, so that went a bit further. Um, but even so, like, it's it's shocking. It's bad, but it's still shocking how much they got for their money. Anyway, I digress. Um, so on to the things that I really enjoyed. The the biggest problem going like as watch as a first time watcher and not knowing that much about the film is I didn't know and I still kind of don't know if this is a comedy film. The first forty minutes of it sure don't fucking feel like it. Like aside from some like really out of place, uh, uh, like gags mostly with the younger brother, it's. It's a like it's a mess of tone, but it's definitely not a comedy. Uh, and then, as soon as Corey Feldman and his buddy and the little brother all get together and decide they're gonna slaughter the 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 vampire clan, it's it's a a, a fr- it's a fun eighties romp. I think in my notes here, I literally write, "Okay, this has become the Goonies." Because it pretty much is. Uh, I mean, you can watch the two and tell me I'm wrong. And it, and it's a good time. It's a good time. The last like 30 minutes of the film, it's fairly short. I think it's only a little over 90 minutes. The last, or, or not even with the, with the, without the credits. Uh, the last 30 to 40 minutes are a fun like horror comedy romp. It's a good time. And what I will say and what I keep uh, getting away from, the point I keep getting away from is even in that first uh, half of the film um, and throughout the second half as well, they do some nice, fairly subtle nods, uh, both some um, foreshadowing uh the one that really stood out to me on that one was the, um, he asks the Max, the, uh, actual head vampire asks to be invited inside. And even for somebody who's fairly well versed in like the vampire lore, it's done subtly enough that it's, it's a, it's a nice, it's a really nice thing to catch. I don't know. That one just kind of spoke to me. Um, but there's little nods like that all throughout the film to like various pieces of vampire lore that are kind of kind of great, uh, well informed, and and a bit of fun um, for you know the eagle eyed viewer. I also, uh, I mean, I'm trying not to just read off my notes because I've got like three pages of notes here. Um, the uh, the one of the others that really stuck out to me was the when they kill the first vampire and then escape, they're covered in this like glitter blood entrails stuff. And I don't know if that's, I'm wondering if that has some influence on the, uh, um, what do you call it? The sparkly vampire thing from, oh fuck. What's it called? That young adult schlock. You know, the thing I'm talking about that I can't remember at the moment. Um, I want to know if that's where that's from. I doubt it's that well informed, but it is pretty good. Uh, likewise, the uh, you're eating maggots bit uh, is a nice reference to now have, even though I've already gone through the reference in, um, in Vampire the Masquerade. Fun to see and know now. Um, but at this point, I'm just getting kind of rambly. I didn't have a terrible time with this film. It's not good. Uh, I might watch it again. But man, that first half is a slog. It is just miserable, like, end to end. Um, with very little redeeming about it. I do understand that there are direct to, uh, direct to DVD or direct to video sequels from like 2008 and 2010. 
And that is like bottom of the spiral Corey Feldman. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Th- those could be fun. I might have to at least peek at those and see what's up. I don't know. But anyway, I could do a more in-depth review of this. I could spend days writing a script, but I'm trying to, I'm really recording this right now because I'm trying to avoid doing that because I know I have it in me. But anyway, I digress. Thank you, Spencer, for, uh, you know, telling me to do this. Um, I probably wouldn't have otherwise, although I think it was in my, in my movie library already. I just had never, I don't know what the context was that I would have meant to watch it before. I think my understanding is a, it's a bit of a cult classic. Um, I don't know if I feel that way about it, obviously, but, uh, it's a, it's a well-regarded film for some reason. But anyway, in response, however, you don't get out of this scot-free. I am going to insist that uh, before... I'll give you some leeway. Um, before the end of February, I want a review of 1998's... Or, sorry, excuse me. 1988's Vampire's Kiss. I look forward to seeing it.